Okay, uh, delighted to say I'm joined by Taggy Fogarty. Taggy, no better place to start off than where did the nickname come from? Because I don't know if I've ever heard you explain it. Yeah, uh, I've explained it a few times now over the last couple of months, all right, but um, actually, simple enough, Shane, as they all are. It started off in primary school, and uh, my older brother was nicknamed Froggy, <clears throat> so I don't know where he got Froggy from, but he got Froggy from somewhere, and I'd say he's happy enough now that that didn't stick, but me being the younger brother then, uh, started primary school, and they called me Tadpole, uh, for obvious reasons, and uh, Tadpole turned into Taddy, T-A-D-D-Y, and over the years, just turned into Taggy. And it is as simple as that, yeah. So I'm lucky Tadpole didn't stick because I don't think that would be a great nickname going around uh, playing hurling for Kenny. So uh, yeah, Tadpole turned into Taggy and it's stuck ever since. And I've been called Taggy, I've been called Tag, I've been called Tadge, I've been called Tina G, I've been called everything bar in there. You could get an awful lot worse, to be fair. You know the way your yeah. your grip at a hurley? So you strike off your right-hand side, which if the left hand, often referred to as kind of cack-handed, I suppose, what people would call it. How did that start with you? And like, I presume people would have been coming over, giving out to you, like underage co coaches trying to change it. Well, it's actually a funny one, Shane, because it was actually the opposite. Um, I obviously started off in primary school, and I don't think I got the proper coaching at a young, young age. I'd seen her infants, first class, second class. And I think I got away with it because I was probably just so good as in, in primary school. I was better than most. I had speed. I was able to hit the ball off the right-hand side and my left-hand side. And I was able to catch the ball. So in my class, I was probably better than everyone else. So they felt that I was okay, that they didn't even have to kind of train, train me, if you get me. So I went through the whole of primary school, holding the hurl the wrong way around. I didn't even realize. And then it was the first year in secondary school. I went to CBS in Tordis and sure enough, I'd say it was only the second training session and I was called over and they said, you're raising the ball the wrong way. And uh, I looked at it and I said, I'm not raising the ball the wrong way. I'm doing this all my life, you know. I was only 14 as well. So he said, yeah, you should be raising it with the, the left hand on the bottom, the way I catch the ball. I catch it in my left, so your right hand should be on top and your left hand should be on bottom. So I said, fair enough, and I tried to practice it, and I tried to hit the ball, and I just could not get it. And I was hitting it, I was mishitting it, and I just could not get it at all. So I said, well, look, I give it a while, I give it two or three weeks, and I couldn't get it, so I said, I'll stick to the old ways. And ever since, all the time, but even the same teacher who taught me that said that I'd never play in Crow Park with that grip. So <laughs> I have one up in them now, in fairness, but yeah, it's just, I just, I slipped through the ranks, to be fair. I think that's what actually happened. When you, you know, so you, you were talking about going to the CBS in Turles. Was it tough as a young Kilkenny man going to school in in, uh, in Tipperary? It actually wasn't. Um, I live in Urlingford, which is just 15 minutes away from Turles. So I'm half an hour away from Kilkenny and I'm 15 minutes away from Turles. And back then, we had a lot of people going to Turles. My own brother went to the CBS. Uh, we had likes of PJ Rain went to the CBS. We had a bus though, we actually had a double decker bus going every Monday morning into Tardis and it was full of Erlingford, it was full of Galmai, it was full of Johnstown, which are all the border counties, all the border towns of Tipperary. And we're all being hauled into all into, into the CBS and Tardis. So we had a big gang of actually Kenny contingent in there, the likes of Joe Rain would have been there. And even in the past, the likes of um, Pat Henderson would have went, Jerry Henderson would have went as well uh, with the Kenny, uh, with the Harvard and Kenny, and they went as well. So it actually wasn't that difficult. It was obviously a little bit of slagging, and around our early times, uh, we used to have a bit of banter and a bit of crack. But uh, no, it, it, it wasn't difficult. It was always just a bit of banter. Because would you have been so, like mid 90s, I suppose, when you would have been in Turles and Tipperary were getting to the All Ireland finals against, or got to that final against Clare? I'd say you were able to fill your boots with a bit of slagging when Clare won. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, look, it's, it's, <laughs> every time, look, whenever Tipperary won, I wouldn't say a whole lot because obviously the teachers are all from Tipperary, so I want to keep them in the good books. But yeah, I used to give a little day here and there. And I think Kenny probably wasn't on the scene really in the 90s, 92, 93, they won the one there in Ireland. But then sure, obviously Tipperary came along the scenes as well. So it's, it was a big mix. It was, tip, it was uh, Tipperary, it was Kenny, it was Wexford, it was Offaly's. So there was no real dominant team. You know, and I think it was, was it 1999, 2000 when I retired. Yeah, 2000 was then when I left school there. So the Kenny actually were champions in 2000. So I left it, I left it on a high note. With it. <laughs> and they couldn't get me back because I wasn't back the year after. <laughs> It's kind of funny the way the Tipperary Kilkenny rivalry has become so strong in the last while and probably not poisonous either. But I'd say when 
when you were a young lad growing up, and I found it myself, Tipperary didn't meet Kilkenny for so long in the championship. And even between 91 and 2002, I wasn't even sure that there was um, any clash at all. It's kind of strange. So did, who did you consider as the, the big rivals growing up? Or was it still Tip because you were in school there? It was probably still Tipperary. <clears throat> and you're dead right, Shay. It wasn't because we were meeting them every, every time. Now, I was at the 91 at Ireland. I remember, I remember the ball slipping in. I don't know, he missed it. Um, I think it was... was his, uh, Skippy Cleary. Cleary. Yeah, Lee, uh, Lee Cleary. Did he miss it or not? He says he struck it right. So I went in. I remember I was at that match. I was devastated. But it was always Tipperary. Because of being on the border, I think. And my own uncle, Pat Dillon, hurled with Kenny. And they used to meet uh, Tipperary an awful lot back in the 60s. And they would have played against the um, the, the great Tipperary team of, say, Pat, or not Pat Fox, but say, the, the man from Torres, I watched it. Uh, Doyle. Doyle, yeah. Doyle and all the boys. And they were Hell's Kitchen, you know. That's what they were called back then. And Kenny got roasted in the 60s with them. I think it's only 67, Pat Dillon beat them in an Ireland final. So talking to me, young kid, Pat Dillon, and being on the border, it was always Tipperary. And probably Cork as well. You know, Cork for being just who they are. Cork, they had the most Ireland Ireland's, they were a very dominant team over all the years. So it was always kind of the bigger teams. But for me, it was always Tipperary. It was like, you can beat anyone or you can get bet by anyone, but don't let Tipperary beat you. You know, it's his gas. And my uncle, God rest his soul, he, he was so adamant about Tipperary. And he, he, he hated them in, in a good way because at the funeral, all the Tipperary guys, you know, some of them uh, carry his coffin. They you know, Pat Fox and these guys carry his coffin. So that will tell you... You know, the respect he had for him. But on the field of play, there was no love lost, you know. And I remember we were playing Tipperary in a league match. And I called in to see the uncle on the way to the Northern Park. He just lived in Freshford on the way. And he just stuck out the hand. He was very weak at the time. He stuck out the hand and he said, don't let them boys beat you. <laughs> you know, so that's, even on his deathbed, the poor old devil, he was, uh, he was still talking about Tipperary and Kilkenny in the rivalry. But look, it is a healthy rivalry. Sometimes it can get bitter. But I think that's just with the older folk now. It's a healthy rivalry now. It's on the day. And then we can have a bit of banter after because most of my friends are actually Tipperary from going to school in Turles. Um, I, I know a couple of lads from Freshford St. Lactans and they would have talked about Pad Illen being this sort of fierce character and they had a couple of stories now I just can't remember off the top of my head but that you know the odd time there might be an old kerfuffle going on in the field would you have heard many stories about him because you know he was on the Kilkenny team of the century I think so he'd be very well told. Yeah. yeah he was very well known yeah I would have heard an awful lot of stories over the years look he obviously wasn't soft, and I think anyone going into Mark Pal Dillon knew they were going into Mark Pal Dillon, you know. And I think um, was it, was it Pat Fox? Pat Fox. I think he wore um, he, he didn't wear boots there one time, but that's not Pat Fox. Uh, Babs Keaton. Know. Babs Keaton. Yeah, right, sorry, Bab Keaton. And um, Babs Babs used to mark Pat, Pat or Pat um, a good a good lot of time, you know. And Pat had a fierce habit of kind of wiping the hurl underneath his sleeve. He just just a habit that he had, you know. And he used to kind of give it a no wipe, you know. And, I think uh, Pa was kind of cleaning up in one match and he told Babs to go in and talk to him and Babs looks over the other side and goes, there's no way I'm going in that man. Look at him, he's sharpening up the sword so he is, you know. So this, just, just small little instances like that. These, these are stories that you hear and there's, there's a great photo in Nolan Park. There's a, the, the fan Larkin, I think, is at one side. Pa Dillon is in the, at the other side and I don't know who the other cornerback is and every one of them have the hurdles up like this and they're going pulling but there's no sign of any ball whatsoever, you know. So he was... He was a tough nut, and anyone that marked him apparently, you know, got got, got enough. And I remember talking to um, Pat Delaney one day as well. Pat Delaney would have uh, would have heard in his later career maybe with him, but he was saying that he played a club match and uh, they were playing Tullerone, and all the Hennessy's were playing for Tullerone. I think there could be six or seven Hennessy's, and they said they're going in. They're going to do Pat Dillon tonight, anyway. That's for sure. Like he's not going to dominate this game. So one by one, each Hennessy used to go in and toss him. And one by one, <laughs> Pat was sending him back out with either a split head or a cut or blood somewhere. So he definitely, there was no love lost on the field. But you wouldn't believe it. He was a pure gentleman off the field. He was quite, he was tall in stature, but he was a pure gentleman. But on the field, something switched and he just turned into a different animal. So it's, it's not that long ago that you were on Dancing with the Stars. How did that come around? Because um, I spoke to one of your teammates now, I'm going to leave him nameless, but he said you were the main man in, in dance-offs in the early mornings at the end of a session. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he would be right, yeah, that man you were talking to. But um, I would be, yeah, on, it's a gallery day, on the holidays and stuff, I always like to dance. And 
do you know what, at the end of the night, there might be another dance-off going on, or we might come across another crowd of fellas, or maybe another team that was on holiday, maybe likes to be a Kerry team or something, you know, and we'd be strutting our stuff, and the chests would be out and stuff, but uh, whenever there's a dance-off, uh, I used to be always called in for some reason, so I had a bit of rhythm, I could just probably move the legs a bit quick, you know, and I could do kind of, there's always kind of a move I could do, I could do, I could do the worm off the ground, and this went down the treat, at half two in the morning, with a couple of pints, yeah, this went down the treat with the lads, it always won, it was a big cheer, you know, it always won, but... When it comes down to the phone call, God, it, it was the most random phone call you could ever get. It was, um, it was actually the day I buried my best friend, actually, the same day, Brother Damien Brennan. When he came across him in the media a few times, I used to work, do a good bit of work with him. And got the phone call that day, and it was kind of, would you be interested in dancing with the stars? And I kind of just said, is it the Kenny, or is it the local club one? or You know, because I, I wouldn't get them phone calls at all to be honest and he said uh, no the RTE one and we kind of paused for a minute so I said right is this a is this a wind up or what the hell it is so I let him talk away and next thing he was kind of talking the talk and he was uh, naming the names and stuff so I said fair enough and uh, I asked him where to get my number from and he just kind of said well your name came up in conversation and we were told that you had a bit of rhythm so I was like <laughs> who was he talking to so it went from there uh, Shane I went up to Dublin and I met him for a coffee uh, it was actually Adam Burns, Nicky Burns' brother. He works for Shin and Lynn, and um, had a coffee with him. And the strange thing about it was, I didn't know whether it was an interview or was I being offered the part. And when I say part, I didn't know what I was going up to. It was kind of right. We've asked you to be on the show, but now we want to kind of suss you out of your personality and see what way you come across. So I kind of walked out, and I was kind of like, Jesus, did I have to sell myself there, or did I sell myself off, or do I even want to do it? No, but yeah, about a month's time later, then they gave me a phone call and said, "Look, you're in if you want to do it." So that's great. So what was the first thing you did? Did you go out and buy a pair of tap dancing shoes or shave the chest? What was it? <laughs> the first, I went out and bought some belly anti uh, fake tan. <laughs> I got me, I got me teeth whitened and uh, bought a bought a white shirt. Uh, no, no, furthest from the further from the point. And um, I did not. Basically, I just they said look, don't tell anyone. So I'm a very quiet person in general. I keep things to myself. I don't like telling anyone. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my family. I didn't tell my sisters, my brothers until literally two weeks before it was going to be released. So I kept it to myself the whole way along. And when it was going to be released then, I just called the family and said, look, I'm going to be on Dance with the Stars. And they just, they nearly clapped. They said, what the hell? <laughs> Are you actually serious? So I said, yeah. And it actually all kicked, I know it kicked off in January, but it really kicked off in December with promotional work and all that. So it was just surreal. But was it odd getting dressed? I mean, they're very different sort of shirts than you'd normally wear in, you know, on a night out. And obviously you've some choice style there in Kilkenny in the first place. But was it weird doing the photo shoots wearing, I don't know, flowery shirts, tight pants, whatever it was? Whatever it was? Yeah, it was. And I tell you, the hardest thing about it was the very first day we were doing a shoot. And this is a shoot for like all the pictures that are going to be released with Dancing with the Stars. And all this, they're going to be on placards around Dublin and they're going to be on magazines and all this. And they're making the little promotional video for the start of the show. So that it's basically when the start of the dance with the start of the show, it's those you're doing a little kind of a dance and all this. And it looks very as if you're doing it all the time. But this was actually the first time that I met the dancers, that I met all the backroom team, all the production. So I had to put on like a big sparkly pair of pants, a big sparkly jacket, a big kind of see-through t-shirt. And I had to dance around to a green screen in the background. I don't know when they're filming, there's a big green screen. And then they put in the graphics afterwards. And here I was dancing. They said, what song do you like? I said, I'm talking, I'd be old school, like 90s, like dance, I like insomnia, all these. So I was dancing around a big empty shed with a green thing behind me to insomnia. And I didn't know anybody. Like, And this is where I went from. So you just had to throw yourself into it. And even the clothes, like I was look, kind of looking at the start, but then I said, look, it is what it is. Throw yourself into it and just do it. And that's what you have to do. Did you get any unusual reactions from people? I mean, it's definitely a departure. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I think at the beginning, a few kind of lads were saying, what are you do dance with the stars for? You know, you're going to make an idiot of yourself. And like, I suppose that was people, like, I didn't really watch the show. I watched bits of it, like, in a Sunday evening. I flicked through it. I think I watched the first series because um, Aidan Matney was on it, you know, so it would have a bit of interest from the GA point of view. But uh, a lot of guys were kind of saying, look, it's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a girly show, or whatever it may be. But I think that was kind of guys who were probably afraid to do it maybe themselves, or like, I didn't know really where they were coming from, but I just thought it was a brilliant phone call to get. I thought it was going to absolutely challenge me. It's going to be out of my comfort zone. I going to experience television on a Sunday night. Um, and whatever happened, whether I did make an idiot of myself or not, at least I tried it. And to me, the worst thing to do was get the phone call and say, no, I'm not interested, because I'd be always wondering, I'd be always in the ifs and buts. 
Plus, whatever else, it could have brought. It could bring some other things out of the media. You wouldn't know what doors would open out of it. And, you know, that, that's why i done it. And i probably done it as well because on the day, the same day my, my best friend died, I got a phone call. And I just, I'm not religious or anything like that, but I just don't believe in coincidences either, you know? So can you talk to me about uh, Brother Damien? Because I even, I remember being at Tuller Owens County final win in the Intermediate last year. And Shane Walsh, who was captain that day, just went on a, a big spiel about him and very much a big tribute to him. Obviously made a huge impact. I think he was tearing up the same day. Jackie Tyrrell, of course, spoke about him too. Can you talk about your relationship with him and, and where you first met him? Yeah, I suppose, like a lot of us, we would have met him kind of when our hurling wasn't going great. So I think it was around 2009 uh, I, I, I met him first, you know, and his name was kind of being bandied around, but it was kind of bandied around in such a way that or brother Damien, he, he works with guys, you know, and you kind of go, well, what does he do? And no one could really tell me. So I plucked up the courage, and that was three or four months, kind of wondering if and what. So I plucked up the courage, and I texted him. And look, I thought I was going out to do 100 laps, and that uh, he was going to stretch me, and then we're going to train every night, and I was going to be better in physical shape, and I'd be ready for training every night. And it did start out like that, absolutely. Um, you know, he, he, he did massage me, he got, you know, he stretched me, and he, he did runs and all that with me outside the training. But... What I didn't realise what was happening was all the time that I was on the physio bed and he was rubbing me out, I was also talking and talking about sport and talking about Kilkenny and talking about the difficulties of maybe not playing or maybe having a bad training session or maybe not being down the dumps and taking things to heart. Because I would have took her in serious, as everybody does. I took it really into heart and serious. You know, I even left my life on hold at times and, you know, concentrate on hurling. So it was the be all and end all. So it wasn't, when it wasn't happening for me, I was down about it. So... What, I, what was happening was I was actually talking to him about it and when I'd leave the room I, I'd feel great you know just, just to offload and it might be good things as well it might be saying God I had a brilliant game that day as well as God I was taken off that day and it was crap so I worked both ways and it was just from there that's how it kind of spiraled and I think for me towards the end it totally turned into kind of talking and letting out all your fears and your doubts about yourself and just kind of building confidence in your game So Within that, do you ever feel, or do you know if he had any sort of a communications with Brian Cody because there was a few E players and like, would he have sort of formally realised that I've got a guy who's acting as a maybe a therapist to some of my players or a sports psychologist? Yeah, it was a funny one, Shane, because he was, Brian Cody, I think, knew about him. Now, he, I don't think Brian would ever even say it, but I think he knew about him, but he didn't know what was going on, if that, if that was the case. He wasn't part of the set up. He wasn't part of the team management. He was just he was just an outsider that guys went to, and he wasn't part of any structure or anything. But I think Brian Cody did know about him, but I did, don't think he knew to the extent guys were going out to him. I didn't know to the extent that maybe the time that I was even spending with him and things like that. And I think it kind of came to fruition maybe at his, at his funeral because you had a lot, a lot of players there. You had a lot of players talking about him. You know, just at the funeral, not on, not on, the, not on the mic at all or anything like that, but just talking about him. And all the good stories. And it wasn't just hurling chain. It was, it was people from far and beyond Dublin, Sligo. Just guys coming down there. He was a teacher. He's a principal in Callan. So he met a, met a lot of students along the way. And he had just great stories about how he helped him. How maybe he got him into institutions. How maybe their life could have been different. They could have been down maybe a worse road. Like maybe drugs or whatever. He worked in Dublin for a long, long time. Came across a lot of guys. And he was still going to Dublin. Visiting guys in prison that... Would, he would have thought, you know, just, just to give him a G up, just to visit him. So this is the kind of man he was. But he said out of the media, he said out of the papers, he didn't want the, the limelight of being this big guru. He just did it behind the scenes, and that was his thing. But as far as Brian Cody, I'd say he knew about him, but didn't know to the extent of maybe what we were doing with him. Is, is, am I right in saying there was a priest involved in Dancing with the Stars also while you were doing it? Yes, there was. Um, Father Ray Kelly, yes, he was. He went viral for um, the Hallelujah song uh, at a mass. Uh, he sang Hallelujah at um actually it was actually at a win. And, yeah, um, I saw it. Brilliant. He, he got a couple of million hits after it, and he went absolutely viral. And he was actually on Britain's Got Talent as well for singing as well. And Simon Cowell, I think, gave him a standing ovation. So he, he was a he was a big character around. Yeah. Yeah. So he went from brother Damien, and then you obviously pr presumably were to some degree friends with Father Ray. Yeah, we were all friends. Like it was kind of a group. It was a group situation. But the fact was, actually, I got um, an apartment in Dublin. Um, they gave us an apartment wherever it was kind of away from home and stuff. And I was rooming with Father Ray, so I kind of got to know him maybe outside of dancing as well. So it was gas. I had an apartment right in dead centre in Dublin, and it was uh, my, my roomie was uh, Father Ray. So we had a few chats. Now we didn't stay that often. 
I'd say I'd say if he stayed about four nights out of the whole contest because he liked going home. I suppose he liked his his home comforts and stuff. But uh, he stayed three or four nights, and we had a little bit of banter, and he gave me a signed book. And so it's amazing. He told a few stories. You know, he didn't join the priesthood. I think till about twenty seven. You know, he had a girlfriend uh, up to then, and he just he, I think he got a moment. I won't say madness, but it's some, something struck him anyway, and he he just joined the priesthood. And uh, yeah, he he had a good story, but. Uh, He's a very intriguing kind of character, you know. It's just kind of a different story maybe than a normal priest would have. You know, when you get paired up with, is it Emily Barker was the name of the dancer you, you did the show with? What was What's Emily. it like getting paired up with someone and you realise, okay, we you don't know what the chemistry is going to be like. You don't know if you're going to, you know, have two left feet. Well, I suppose you kind of, if you can do the worm, you're not doing so badly. But you don't know how it's <laughs> going to go. How it's going to go. What was that like getting introduced to her? Yeah, it was, it was strange. It was really strange because... Yeah, exactly. You're going into a kind of a dancing environment. And to be fair, look, it's all touchy, feely. It's very close. You're close up. And then you have to, have to act the dance together. You have to kind of have a connection and things. So to, for me, it's very awkward kind of at the beginning because, you know, we'd be doing, you know, you'd be starting off, you'd put your hands in a certain kind of a hold or whatever. And I'd be kind of, you know, I'd be afraid to put my hand maybe on her waist. And literally, she'd be grabbing my hand and she'd be putting on the waist. And I'd be going, right. And she still says, look, you have to get over this. It is what it is. If you don't, if you don't start doing this, you're not going to dance properly. So then I said, look, fair enough. What, like, what can you do? But for me, it was a bit awkward because you just don't know what they're thinking or what you're thinking. And I, that wouldn't be my thing. Obviously, dance is not my thing anyway. So I wouldn't be all touchy-feely. And even from a hugging perspective, the guests, the first night we met all the dancers, they're all hugging and, or, you know, they're all huggy, touchy-feely-feely. And, I think, oh, well, me personally, I wouldn't be that way at all. I'd be kind of standoffish and if someone went to hug me, I'd be kind of like, what are you doing kind of thing? So, uh, yeah, it took a while to get used to it. But um, I couldn't have asked for a different part better partner. She was absolutely brilliant. And she had a lot of experience. She's just her fourth year. She's there all the years. And so she had a lot of experience. And she was very driven. We put a lot, a lot of hours in, like 10 in the morning to 10 at night. So it was, it was hard work. But, uh, yeah, no, that was brilliant. I was looking very good together. Yeah, I don't know if you watched the last dance recently, the one with um, with Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls. But there was a particular period where he decided to go and play baseball for a year, and one of the things he talked about was having to adjust athletically from building his body as a basketballer to then building his body as a as a baseballer, and then vice versa. Going back, it probably took him a full summer to to recondition his body. Did you find that your body, you know, you'd done intercounty for whatever it was eleven years, now you were trying to go and do dancing that it was like starting all over again and, and you had to repurpose your body. In ways, yeah, I watched the show, it's, it's, it's an excellent show, and uh, yeah, in ways I did. Now, I suppose I'm out hurling at the top, top level for since 2014, so five years or four, six years, I'm going from the top level, but I've been playing club all along. But what I found was the fitness level, I just, it, it was unbelievable, the fitness level for dancing. Now, I, once I knew I was going to be on the show, I went to the gym, you know, I was keeping myself in shape. I wasn't, I wasn't going to be out of shape, turning up on television <laughs> half naked, you know. So I, mean, I was definitely trying to keep myself in some sort of shape. Uh, but I was doing kind of just runs and stuff like that. But what I found was that just different muscles in your body was being affected. You know, my feet were killing me, like absolutely killing me. The soles of my feet were killing me because I was on them all the time. And I suppose it's kind of a muscle that you forget that it's actually your feet. I know we walk around, you take it for granted, but... The soles of my feet, and I was asking Emily, are your feet sore? And she was like, no, they're grand. No, I'm perfect, you know. So my feet were killing me, my hips were killing me, and my grinds were killing me because you'd be stretching out. You're kind of, it's different movement. And you're doing a dance for maybe a two-minute dance on a Sunday night, and people go, all right, that was grand. But you'd be out of breath after two minutes. But what people forget is when you're rehearsing during the week, you're doing that two minutes, but you might be doing that 70 or 80 times a day. And it's literally, if you're doing a hard dance, say like the jive, I lost three quarters of the stone in three weeks. And I wasn't carrying a whole lot of weight, but I just, all the muscle mass just went for me because I wasn't doing weights or anything like that. So I went, it was just pure cardio. And it was like a hit session every time. And I just went, I went, I toned up. I got, yeah, I lost all my muscle mass, but I toned up. But it was just constant. It was like a hit session every, every time. And it was, it was, a, it was an eye opener. And even the slowest of dances, you'd be out of breath because you're holding, like you're the fella, you're supposed to keep the girl up. You're supposed to be in hold. And it's it's a different level. It's a, I have a newfound respect for him now, that's for sure. How would you compare the nerves with that of a hurling match? And, and I mean, it must be a very different experience because in a hurling match, fair enough, everyone is looking at you when you have the ball. But as soon as you come out on the stage, everybody, including everyone at home, is looking at you. Is it, <laughs> What's that like? Yeah, it's... Um, 
it's a total different experience. Um, I suppose the fact is, first of all, I've been playing hurling since six years of age. So I just, just hurling just comes natural to me. The matches come natural to me. I'm doing it all my life, even building up the big games. Like even when you're play, playing under eight, you know, a match down the field on a Saturday morning, that's the biggest game of your life. Like, you know, that, and there's people, just people at the sidelines and things like that. And so I built it up from there. And then you play in Ireland and you're playing the bigger games. So you're just used to it. It's just constant. That's, that's what you do. That, that's your team. That's your sport. And I think as well, you just hit the nail on the head. It, you're, you're part of a team. It's 15. So yeah, you're in the limelight, but you're only might be in the limelight when you're on the ball. And then there's blame games or there's the heroes of the game. And it's like, it's the team itself or you played well that day. But dancing, it's all about you. And even doing the interviews, I felt... With Kenny, it was kind of, you know, you have your GEA standard interview where you're very humble and you're playing up the other team and you're kind of going, look, we're not going great. You know what I'm saying, the, <laughs> the speed you get. Oh, I've heard you out for just, years. That's, that's, just, that's just the GEA nature. That's just the GEA um, <laughs> interviews that you get. But um, dancing is just a whole new set of nerves. I was petrified on a Sunday evening. I'd have nerves hurling, but literally on a Sunday evening, right before I went on, I would be petrified. I remember the first show, Emily just said, are you okay? I was green in the face and I wasn't talking to anyone. And I do that anyway. When I get nervous, I just don't talk to anyone. I kind of get into the zone. But literally, if you go left instead of right on national television, <laughs> you're done. There's no recovery. Like in sports, you can get back up the next ball or whatever it is. But in dancing, it's just if you make one mistake. And what the thing is, if you make one mistake or get the count wrong, it can mess up the whole dance because your count can be out for the whole dance then. And then, then, you're, then you're in big trouble. But... It's just no comparison. And even after it, after there is a small bit of comparison, when the dance is done and you've nailed it, there is a sense of like winning a big match. You're coming off this, the, the stage, come up the dance floor saying, yes, I nailed it. And you're up to Nikki's box and we're having a chat and you're just relieved that the whole thing is over and you've done it well. So in comparison to hurling, I suppose, it's the same thing with playing well in the match as coming off the dance floor. But the nerves was just totally different. So much out of my comfort zone that it made me more nervous that... What will I do if I get it wrong? How will I recover? You know, things like this. But for dancers, it was just their norm. It was like, well, it was playing sport. It was just their norm. They just got on with it. And that's what they do all their life. So I, I, I know you're, you're saying that you train endlessly and do uh, endless repetitions of getting these routines right before you go out there. Much and all, as you would have been trained to the nth degree and you would have been given every bit of preparation possible, did you ever go out thinking, I don't feel fully prepared for this. You know, nothing to do with anyone who's training you, but where you felt like, I am actually going to mess this up, I don't know it properly. Yeah, 100%, yeah. There was two dances, the cha-cha dance, which we only had three days to prepare for, because actually what happened was, the election was on the Sunday, so they pulled the show back to the Saturday. So that means our Friday and Saturday were gone, which meant we were training on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because we had Mondays off. It's kind of a specific thing, you have to have it off. So I only had three days and I remember going in, I was going, my God, I am just not ready for this. And I actually forgot my steps that night. But thank God to the good work of the camera, camera shit and the production team, they didn't really catch it on camera. But if you were at the show, I was literally walking around because I forgot my steps. And I was supposed to do a certain step at a certain time. Totally went down my head. Um, she turned, Kylie was actually, that was a switch-up partner. She turned around and my eyes were huge because I went, I was stunned. I was like, what, what's next <laughs> I, I was done like so she caught me and she turned me around and we just walked around for the rest of the dance and I remember going coming off that stage and the judges didn't slate me at all for some reason I got I think got sixes which is, was alright like in fairness um, but I, I was just my heart was pumping and I just had to get through it and that was it so that was a chat chat that was three days and they um, so it was the what was it oh the Paso Doble as well uh, just a really hard dance very technical and it said look I could be in trouble here and I got through it, but it wasn't the most comfortable dance. But I got through it, and it's amazing, I suppose, when you have to get when you have to get something done, you'll just go with it. You, you have to. And the dancers are very good. They do disguise you. They got in certain positions where you, you might be seen on television. But, yeah, there was two incidents there. And after them two incidents, I was like, oh, I'm done. I just, I can't take these nerves. I'm done with the show. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I couldn't see the end product, but I got over it anyway, and I got back to basics, yeah. Did the like obviously I think it was Lottie Ryan won it for a finish. Were, were the Kilkenny boys getting behind you throughout this, and I, I presume even the whole county was getting behind you? And um, were you, were you disappointed that you didn't quite get over the line? Um, yeah. Look, first of all, I got huge support from Kilkenny, from surrounding counties. I got more text messages. I got letters. I got uh, you know on Instagram, social media. 
everything that I got was positive. You know, I think uh, Father Ray got a few letters from, you know, say the religious side of things given out about dancing with scantily glad girls and all this. But that was his story. My story is that I was getting loads of support. Can Kenny back me 100%? And yeah, at the start, Kenny boys were slagging me about my red pants and me, me fake tans and all this. But like, I'd say they were just jealous behind the scenes because towards the end, they're all looking for tickets for the show. <laughs> so they're mad to get up and uh, experience the whole, the whole outfit. But um, yeah, I, serious um, support I got. And I'm just really grateful. And at the end of the day, it is a competition. And I am competitive. And I think most sport people are very competitive. In a nature that you don't want to see anyone fall over on television, but you want to probably do your best to put you in the best position to try and win the show. And the thing, the way it ended was Lottie won the show and she's a fantastic dancer, way better than me. You know, she's a fabulous dancer. But the way it ended was, with, obviously with COVID and all that, there was, no, um, there was no audience in the show. So it was like a pre-rehearsal. And then it was kind of announced that the winner was Lottie and we're all kind of going, did that actually happen? You know, even now it feels like as if, something didn't finish, if, if, if that makes sense, because we're going to pull the show. Uh, but look, we're very lucky we did get a final, and did get a, a, a finalisation on it, and, and where we stand. But uh, well, yeah, I was disappointed. You know, if you're in it, you may as well try and go win it. And I made it to the final. So when you're in a final, you want to win it. Mm. With all that TV coverage, you must have women baiting down the door now. <laughs> I, uh, I have a fair... Yeah, you're not the only man to ask me that, but uh, yeah, my social media is getting a bit more late than our eight, to be fair, yeah, and I think, uh, I think my six-pack came out one night, and I got a few messages after that as well, so it was, uh, ah, yeah, look, it was unreal, the, the, the whole thing, it was just a bit surreal, to be honest, even the whole production, the cameras, and being in the limelight in a different capacity, not in a GA sense, no, it's all about you, it's about your personality, it's how you're coming across on television, and yeah, we got, I got a few messages here and there, and uh, I just say social media is a strange place at times, Shane, yeah, I can tell you that. <laughs> well, I mean, just behind you there, I can see that there's makeup still up on the top of that shelf, <laughs> and I'm st there, there has to be questions over that. <laughs> there will be questions asked, yeah, there's makeup brushes behind me, and I have fake tan inside the door, but I'm in the room where my sister does her makeup, right, so just to clarify any suggestions there, I'm still not putting on makeup, and I'm still not putting on fake tan, but the thing is, right, it's, it's amazing. You'd be giving out about fake tan at the beginning. I was as well. But you do look a hell of a lot better with fake tan on. <laughs> it does take that pace to this off you. So I do miss the fake tan to a bit. I won't be going back to it, but I do miss it a smart. <laughs> no doubt. What about the, the Kilkenny years? Just to go back to Hurlem for a while. What, what sort of camaraderie did you have? I mean, just again, talking to one of your teammates, they said that you were one of the few lads now who was able to slag with the likes of Jackie Tyrrell, that he would have been able to, you know, I suppose, hold the whip hand over most, but you always had an answer for him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> myself and Jackie, I would look a great relationship, but we'd always slag Jackie, and he'd always slag me, and I won't say it to be the, to be, to the, to the bone, but after a few pints, it could be to the bone, you know, and, but look, if you can't give it, don't, if you can't take, if you can't give it, don't take it, and, um, we had, we had a great all spirit, and I think that's what kind of brought us together because we slag each other to the death after matches. You know, I think um, I was slagging them, I think it was in 2009 or Ireland, I was slagging them over something, you know, and uh, oh, I had them, and I always had the, the edge over Jackie, you know, but he came out because Jackie scored a pint in that Ireland, and he came out, and I didn't score that day, and I was playing corner forward because, well, at least I, at least I scored from corner back, he says, well, I nearly dropped. <laughs> and all you could hear the boys going, oh, gee. So he had me on that one, all right. But uh, look, we had a great banter. I think there's a group was there that came through the ranks. I suppose Tommy Welch, uh, JJ Delaney, David Herity, Brian Hogan, Jackie Tyrrell. And I think, I suppose at the time, people weren't seeing the personalities of them because as a team, we just played as a team. I think Brian Cody, to be fair to him, had a kind of a media, it wasn't a media band, but he kind of said, look, guys, don't be playing up to the media. And it's very seldom that we do interviews and sell our personality. But now you see the personality. You see, like Tommy Welch, he's an absolute pantomime. Jackie's on RTE. He's his personality. He's a bit of crack as well. JJ, you know, he says every, everyone has a different personality and big personalities. And I think that's what fed into the team. And the fact, of course, that we're winning, you know, success breeds success. And we're getting holidays to these unbelievable destinations. And we were building up a spirit through all them destinations and all them nights out. And Brian Cody loved it as well. He loved that we went out together and that we had serious crack. You know, there were some games we went through the back door, I think, in 2013, and it was game on game. And I think it was after the Waterford game. None of us had uh, the going out clause, as they call them, in the bag. You know, none of us bought it because we were literally hurling two weeks' time. 
And Brian was delighted and won the game. And he goes, go out tonight, lads. Enjoy yourselves. And back in Tuesday the night, you know. And we all kind of looked around and said, did he just told us to go out? So sure enough, so we met again. He got the shirts and we met up and out we went again. But he loved that we were going out together and building the spirit together. Because, you know, in fairness, that's what happens. You know, when you go out, you get to know people better. But we had, we had great times and holidays are just... Just brilliant holidays, and thank God there was no camera phones back then. You know, we got we got away with a lot of stuff, and the fact that we're winning, there was nothing in the papers. We were just we were this elite team, probably that you know, we were like uh, like statues just going up and winning matches. But it's far from the truth. You know, we we enjoyed our time, and we had great spirit. But the fact that we had kind of slagged each other, but we also had each other's back no matter what. If someone else slagged us, we'd be we'd be behind him, and we'd be saying, "What are you saying?" You know, if he wasn't part of the setup, you know. And I think that's that's what fed into it as well. It's brilliant. Did you ever get to know Brian Cody before or since? Like, do you, do you feel like you know him as a person? Um, I tell you, through the early years, I came on the panel in 2003. I came on in said actually, there's actually the Charlie Carter incident when Charlie Carter got dropped um, in the first round of the championship. I actually came in instead of Charlie, and so it was the worst thing that nearly happened to me because everyone was saying Charlie's gone, and I came in. And where did I sit? I sat straight into Charlie Carter's chair in the dressing room. So I got a slagging from day one. So I did, you know, coming in here, a rookie here taking Charlie Carter's seat. But um, back in the early days, Brian was a bit more relaxed. And I remember we used to go, was it for, I think it was actually 2003, um, for the Ireland final, the Ireland semi final. We went down on a paintballing trip. This, this is how, you know, back then, how, how it was. It was a paintballing trip instead of a, a trip away training. And um, we did a paintball, and it was around Bennett's Bridge at the time. And uh, we had a few cans back in the shed. Uh, where all the paintball and gear was, you know, and we were allowed to drink. And this is literally three out, three weeks out from the from the Ireland semi final. And Brian had a few cans as well, you know. So and he let he, he was talking to players. I remember him in dressing rooms. He'd have the banter with uh, with um, you know Stephen Graham, with PJ Ryan. He'd be slagging about where they're from, and he was more involved with the players um, as a manager, you know. But then around on the 2005, in Galway Bay is in the Ireland semi final. <clears throat> I think it was the year Project turned the ball over. Um, the centre back there from Donna Megan, I think his name. And I think after that, Brian just said he got too close to the players, and that made him a bit soft. And he was going definitely after that, he made a bridge between management and players. That yes, he talked to us, but only on the management level and only said the bare essentials. He didn't really have the crack with us, he didn't really converse. There's always kind of a manager kind of a feel to it. And look, I suppose he's not there to make friends, and if you're making tough decisions. And if everyone's friends with Jay, you're not doing your job correctly, you know. And so look, the proof is in the pudding. He's one of the top GA managers of all time. And, you know, it is what it is. But to say that, do I know Brian Cody? I probably knew him better back in the early days than I do now. You know, he never let his guard down. Now, when I retired, we chatted on the phone and you could see his personality come through. We just said, look, congratulations. And we had a great innings. And, you know, we had a bit of crack, you know, a bit of laugh. And, and that was it. But I met him actually, Dance with the Stars is on. I was at a GA function. Um, you know, we're talking to the Glam B or the GEA for Kieran's College, and GA and myself and Hugh was up the stage talking. And Brian, being Brian, just came over and just shook me hand and said, You're a dancer now. And I, <laughs> I just looked at him and said, I'm a dancer now, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> he just walked away, and that was it. A little smirk on his, on his face. And uh, you know, that, that was it, and that's the way he is now, you know. Do you think it was difficult for him to just kind of go from being, you know, like you were saying, having a few um, cans in the dressing room, having to crack with the lads, to sort of build that demarcation line where now he was the manager? Because everyone had been used to, you know, based on what you were saying, chatting away to him. Like, how do you go midstream from being one of the guys to, I'm the manager, we've all got our roles and keep our distance? Yeah, I think it's probably more so for the older players because they would have been used to maybe conversing with them and things like that. And say in my time, when I came in 2003, 2004, a lot of them older players went and there was a new era brought in around 2005, 2006, the likes of Cha, Fitz, Richie Powers, you know, even myself, Jackie, we're all ready to be new to the team. So I suppose he set a precedence for us starting out um, that we he wasn't going to kind of get to know us as such. But he just, what he did was he didn't really converse with, with the older people. Like, you know, he'd have a bit of crack He'd smirk, but he'd walk outside the dressing room, and, and that and that would be it. And he could see the whole. No, I don't know whether other people notice it, but I definitely notice it that the whole mantra was changed, and he had a wall up, and he became ruthless. You know, it was a stage where I think it was two thousand and five again that he dropped. I think he could have dropped about thirteen. Now, when I say drop, he let him off the panel with the option of maybe coming back on. And I don't know what way it kind of worked, but there's a lot of guys that were dropped from it. So I think about four were actually dropped. But he asked everyone else back in 
well, one, like one or two didn't actually come back in because they felt in their right that they shouldn't have been dropped in the first place. I think Sean Down got the phone call to come back in, and Sean Down was around the blocks a long time, and he just said, "No, Brian, look, it's, it's not for me," and and that was the end of that. And Brian said, "Right, fair enough." So, like the proof was in the pudding. He was dropping guys, he was making big decisions, and he was stepping away from the players. And I think he was getting results as well. He was winning, so I think he felt that that was the right structure for him to do. Because just as you're talking there, I'm thinking to myself, part of the joy in this, you know, and is is not necessarily picking up the medal or or lifting the tr- the trophy or what have you. It's the the joy of the journey and all that, the pursuit and everything like that. That that's the part that people talk about later on. And I'm kind of thinking, if you're Brian Cody and you're sort of creating a distance between yourself and the guys you're going on a journey with, I kind of wonder, do you get as much out of it? Now he stayed there for so long and won so much, and there's no doubt he gets pleasure in it. But does the, the, the two things not seem at odd to get the joy and separate yourself a little bit from the lads on the journey? Yeah, I understand exactly where you're coming from. Yeah, you want to be involved, you want to be kind of involved with the team and all that. But I think Brian is so driven and he loves sport and he loves hurling and he loves winning. You know, he loves winning. That's that's what he that's what drives him. You know, it drives him to first of all hurling, he's loving hurling, first of all, he just he just loves it. And he loves sport and he loves winning. So whenever he wins, that drives him on for every year. Because every year that Brian Cody lost, he came in a different animal in the dressing room the year after. He was a different, like 2010 when Tippy is, he was a different animal. 2005 when Galway Bettas, he came back in, stood away from players, changed. So every year, he brought something different to it, which I think is probably most important because if you're going to go back with the same mantra or the same team that failed the year before, something has to change or else they're just going to fail again. But I think what he really enjoyed, like he still had a rapport with the players. He didn't just not talk to us. He still had a bit of crack. He saw the crack that we were having. He saw the banter that we were having. And he'd often see him having a wry smile or, you know, a bit of a state, you know, just, you know, and when you see him Brian Cody having a wry smile, then you know you're like, you're having the crack now, you know, and everyone, you know, that kind of way. Team meetings as well, he'd make a few digs or a few comments, you know, just banter. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't slack bad, but it was like as if, no, Brian Cody talked, he made a bit of a joke, it was funny, you know, that's the banter. <laughs> if, if you can understand that, you know, and when Brian Cody is making them kind of statements, that's when we're all saying, ah, like, we're all in it together, the spirit is good, you know, and there's one night when, where he lets his guard down, that's the All-Stars night. Um, if you catch Brian Cody in All-Stars night, that's where he's having a few beers, and that's when he talked to you, and that's where he'd slag you about all the year, about how your form was, and different things. And after that night, it's back to basics, you know, but... Brian Cody loves it. Brian Cody loves Kenny. Brian Cody loves hurling. And that's what he gets his, that's his buzz. And he wants to win. And he's a manager. If he's not winning but having the crack, he's not doing his job. So he has to do his job correct as well. Can, can you ever believe that, that moment, you know, when Mick Jacobs scored the winning goal for Wexford, where he actually is over beside, he's right beside the goals where he can see the goal and collapses down on his knees. It's kind of astonishing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy moment. I was actually on, I came on that day actually. That was, um, came on that day against Westford, yeah, and it was just, you could see uh, the whole thing being sucked down, you could see just the whole year being faded, and look, we, we often had in the dressing room that any year that you don't win that Ireland Ireland is a failure year for the Kenny, and it's a waste of a year, so you could see him drop, you could see the passion, you could see the drive, and we were so close that day to get, you know, get over the Leinster final, it could have been, you know, in an Ireland final, whatever the case may be, but... That's how much he loves it. That's how much he takes it to heart. And he does take it to heart. You know, he gets angry over things like that. And that's that's his drives in him. That anger comes out on us as players. When we were there anyway, it comes out on us. And that's what drives us on as well. Um, how important was it when Mick Dempsey came in? Because like he was there for so long. And I mean, definitely Brian Cody obviously has huge time for him. But like how big of him, like from inside the camp, how big was he? Yeah, he, he was huge, uh, Shane. I think, um, obviously, he was, he was um, Brian's right-hand man, really, you know, in, st- in terms of strength and conditioning. And I think he came in at a very, very right time as well. I think the game was changing a bit. Um, 2003, I didn't do any weights. 2004, didn't do any weights. 2005 then, because I had Mick Densby actually under 21. He was strength and conditioning. He was a selector and strength and conditioning for under 21 team. And Martin Forkley was the manager. So he was bringing a bit of core into it at that stage. And then 2005, the whole thing kind of, the whole mantra changed. And it was because of Mick Dempsey. And perhaps it was because of his football background. Because everyone, well, not everyone, but maybe the thought process was that you don't do weights as a hurler. It will slow you down. Hurling is a fast game. It's elusive. You have to be flexible. 
it'll slow you down if you do weights, you know. But Mick didn't believe that. Mick was coming from maybe a, a football background, and you can see the footballers, the kind of they were a lot stronger than the hurlers, maybe, but were back then a lot more physical because it was more physical game. They had to be ready for it. So I think Mick probably sat down with Brian and said, "Look, this is the way forward." And in fairness to him, he went to a lot of camps. He went to soccer camps. He flew over to New Zealand uh, on the off season to see what they were doing, see what weights they were kind of doing, the kind of training they were doing. And he came back with maybe all this kind of knowledge and integrated into the Kilkenny setup. Now, it wasn't to a, an absolute total professional level, Shane. It was more the basics of weights. Um, but you can see the difference uh, in about six months' time with everyone. The fact that we only started to do them. You know, when you start doing weights, there's a change straight away that you've never done them. So it wasn't that like to his one-to-one sessions. And I think that's what made it better for us because it wasn't so serious that you had to turn up on a, on a non-training night in a group get your session done, mark down what you have to do. I'm here and that's what you have to do now. But in our time, it wasn't what you have to do. You had your program, it was up yourself to do it. And really, if you weren't doing it, you were going to be left behind. And I think that's why people, they, they did it. They were on a successful team. You knew the potential there that you're going to be in a semi-final or possibly in Ireland nearly every year. So to be on that team was huge. So from a player's perspective, you wanted to do it. But it wasn't enforced to, to the letter of the law. And that's what we enjoyed. It was a bit of slackness in it. But his thought process was, was, was very good as well in the sense of what type of weights maybe people needed to do, like upper body. I remember Chad doing a lot of upper body for his free-taking ability and the goalies used to do a lot of upper body as well uh, for, the, for the poking out the ball and all that. So he was, he was very good, but he, he relied a lot on weights. And I think it went away from the whole just turning up, throwing in the hurdles and a 15-on-15 game. He brought a kind of professionalism to it that the players were craving at the time. Like the- you were obviously a team that had won all Ireland's anyway under Cody, or two and or three most recently, and then Mick Dempsey comes in, and so you were right up at the very top. But then you become a team who actually embraces a bit of S and C and proper modern um, sort of approach to it. It's probably no surprise then, like anyone I think who's done a proper S and C program for any length of time realizes that they improve dramatically and well. They, they definitely improve in a very short space of time. It's probably no surprise that you kind of jumped up above other teams because you were already just as good, had some brilliant hurlers coming through, and now you were preparing more professionally than other teams. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably you're probably right. Yeah, we had we had fantastic hurlers, and I think um, we probably took over from the the Cork era and what they were doing. They were talking about their diet and how they remind themselves off the field. Now I don't know whether they were doing weights or not back then. I couldn't tell you what Cork were doing. But the fact they were even saying that meant that maybe we weren't doing enough. So maybe Ryan Cody then, after losing 04 and 05, felt something needed to change. And you're dead right. The players found the difference straight away. Straight away, I found that I wasn't getting injured as much. That was the first thing I found straight away, that my whole core was strengthened up. I was able to take hits bigger. Um, and from a team's perspective then, the player, like we had Richie Powell, like you know all the players, JJ, Tommy Welch, Henry Sheff, like, Great stigma, great players anyway. And then to combine that with weights and SNC, and that's professionalism, probably a year or two before other teams started it meant that we had a step ahead straight away. And maybe that's what maybe kind of led to the to the few successes we had in six, seven, you know, eight and nine or whatever the case may be, because we were that step ahead with brilliant hurlers. You, you made your debut in 04, championship debut, and I saw a quote from you. The full forward line was DJ Carey, Henry Shefflin, and myself, two of the best hurlers of all time, and me. What, <laughs> what was it like having your debut beside the, the two of them? Ah, it's mad. I remember um, oh, I made a big mistake that day. Uh, it was a really warm day. Uh, <laughs> I'm making excuses already, but I remember I'm from, from a farming background, you know, and it was my first game and I was lining out between Henry Sheffield and DJ Carey. First of all, DJ Carey is my idol. I grew up with him. Like, he was just phenomenal. The best hurler I've ever seen. Still, in my eyes, the best hurler I've ever seen. And then they have Henry Sheffield look at the time and still is one of the best hurlers as well. But I went out into the yard around 2 o'clock. There was an evening game in Carrow around 7 o'clock. It was a warm day and I went out into the yard with my brother and we pucked balls for at least an hour and a half. I remember it well. And I said, right, get me eye in here. I'm, I'm on the ball. You know, there was no such thing as rest, recovery, or the top process of a match back then. And sure enough, I turned up in Carlo, but I was half drained as I was. And it showed I was taken off in the second half. I, look, for my first debut, I was happy enough. I think I scored, I think I scored a point or two at the end, but I was happy enough. I did, I did okay, but I was drained. I was taken off. So that, that was my first mistake, but... Lining out between, between them two boys in the full forward lane, it was a bit mad. I didn't think of it at the time. I think it's just 
I just went with it as a player. It was just I had to go with it, but yeah, it was, it was a bit surreal, and I felt a bit out of my depth beside them two boys. And I felt that if I got the ball, I felt that I'd always really have to give it off to them because they were the goal scorer, they were the men getting the points, they were the leaders of the team. So if I got the ball, I felt that I had to give it to them straight away instead of maybe just taking a bit of glory for myself and making my own imprint. Um, but look, that 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 was the they were the characters you were dealing with. You know, such um, such high presented present lads in the GDA and huge characters in Kilkenny as well. Did you ever develop a telepathic understanding with any of the other players <coughs> on the panel or the team? Because, I mean, it's something that, you know, maybe you and your brother, you kind of know what each other is going to do before one of them even gets the ball. Did you ever develop that with anyone on the Kilkenny panel? <coughs> yeah, um, I did for sure, yeah. I think um, I think nearly with, with, with that whole team, there was a stage of maybe six, seven and eight where the team was playing together constantly, maybe with one or two changes. So in around me was definitely Martin Comfort, Henry Shefflin and Eddie Brennan were always kind of in around that full forward line. So I knew straight away that the likes of Henry and Martin Comfort, that the ball is going to break, no matter what. And usually it was going to break in front because Gorta, if he didn't catch it, he was going to tip it down and it was going to land in front of him. So I was always making that run straight across the full forward line just to pick up that break and if it didn't happen it didn't happen but if it did happen if you're picking up the ball in the 60 yard box you know there's a likelihood of a goal or a point coming from it and the same way with Henry he was always going to break very little times of breaking behind because they were so good at even getting their hand to it or letting it break down so from that perspective definitely in the full forward line I was I, I knew what was going to happen and then up more up the field then say from the half back line our half back line was our dominant half half back like that's where the launch pad was you know and I think it took maybe a year or two for other goalies to figure out not to be launching the ball on top of JJ or Tommy Wench or Brian Hogan because they're just going to snap it out of the air so whenever I saw the ball going high into our full back line I was making our run across the field over to the other corner forward and Eddie used to make the run as well because we'd look at each other and we wouldn't even say anything but we'd be just gone the fact being that we knew JJ nine times out of ten was going to catch the ball and when you catch the ball primary possession you're, you're going to lose your marker you're going to have a strike and you're going to have time to look up so what the boys always done they caught the ball looked up and placed it into where we were making the run where we had two or three yards on the corner back so we had space made even before they knew we were going to have it so thing, things like that over the years definitely helped uh, the likes of Chaff Fitz he'd, he'd always look up first and if you're available he'd give it to you if you weren't then he'd let it in you know, it's just small things like that. And it is, I suppose, telepathic is nearly a too strong a word, but it's that feeling of playing with a team constantly and knowing their movements and knowing what they're going to do. Owen Larkin, the same. If he caught a ball, he was going to play for a free. He'd do the old head under the arm kind of thing. And if he didn't get that, he was going to lay off a hand pass because he couldn't take any more steps. So he had to be on his side. You know, it's just small things like that you would have learned over the years. And I suppose it is telepathic, but it's just from playing with them the whole time. Obviously, 2006 is the one you're always reminded of because you got uh, 1-3 in the final name, man of the match. What clicked for you that day? Um, there was a few things, I think, uh, Shane. I think I was definitely under the radar. Um, that year, I broke my collarbone. I, did, I had a good league that year. And I remember um, the league final, we were playing Limerick, and it was Martin Damien Ray. And, and um, I think I scored about three points off Damien Ray. And Brian just came up after the match and said, well done, you know, and after having a good league. And that was it. So then, back in training, after the club scene, and I broke my collarbone. And Brian just came up and said, look, we're not going to forget what you've done in the league. And get yourself back, get yourself right. So, sure enough, I came back anyway. And I came, I missed the Leinster Championship, but I came back in for the semi-final. I learned semi-final, I played Clare. And that poor game, I was taken off. So, getting to the Ireland, I didn't know whether I was going to be playing or not. You know, taking off in Ireland semi-final. The likelihood is, I wasn't. I missed a lot of the year. When he started me, so I think the first thing was I was definitely under the radar and nobody really knew much about me. I probably they were probably watching the Henry Shefflins or probably watching the Eddie Brennans, you know, I probably wasn't keeping an eye on, on me, you know. Um and the second thing I remember vividly was on the Saturday. I was sitting down and I watched um oh god, what's the name? Any given Sunday, you know, just to get myself kind of driven up for it's kind of a sport um motivation of feeling, you know, as long as you know it. But uh, I sat down watching that and I just remember after I just remember saying Whatever happens tomorrow happens. And even me saying that out loud, I said it out loud to myself, I just said, whatever happens tomorrow happens. And if I get to 55 minutes, I'll be happy. And if I'm taking off a dummy job, that'll be it. And yeah, that, that, those two things I just remember, I just said, look, whatever happens, happens. And it's only a game. And they might say, yeah, it's only a game. It's your first Ireland you're going to be playing and it's a huge game. But for me, that's, that's what I just said. And 
I always kind of played well against Cork for some reason as well over the years. And uh, yeah, it just it just happened on the day then. And it kind of happens sometimes. It you've seen Wally Welsh, you've seen Shane there from uh, Clare, the same team. It just clicks on the day maybe when they're just the underdog and it, it all happens on the day. I presume that would go down as your favourite <laughs> final, especially against the Cork team that were going for three in a row. It would, yeah. No, it would. I th- not for getting man in the match. I think it was everything else besides. I think it was maybe Kilkenny hadn't won in Ireland since 2003, which is not long at all. But in Kilkenny terms, and maybe with that team, it seemed like a long time. Um, and there was a big kind of a hype for the Ireland final. So when you're kind of out, half and won in a while, there's a better kind of a graft or there's more of a hunger for it. And I think with that team as well, they kind of, we trained so hard that year and in the back of our heads, we always want the car. We always want, we, like, it's like any team, you always want the bigger team. It's like maybe when Tipperary are winning, we want Tipperary and vice versa. We can Kenny win, we want, to break, we want to beat the big guys, you know, to put ourselves on the map. And it wasn't even, stop, it wasn't even about stopping car for three in a row, it was about getting our own hard earning. A lot of us happened in our earning back then. I happened being, getting one on the field play, Jackie had one on the field play, Brian Hogan. So there was a relatively new kind of couple of guys craving their first All Ireland. And I think that was it. And for me as well, it was actually playing my first All Ireland, just to experience that. It wasn't about man of the playing well, it was just the experience of your first All Ireland final. And yeah, it went well for me on the day, but it was just playing in the first All Ireland was huge. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It, do, does any other final? I think you started all four of the finals in the four in a row run, didn't you? Did any other ones? Yeah, yeah. Out? Yeah, four or five, yeah, or four, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, 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 and Saturday 10 as well, yeah. Um, yeah Would yeah. any of those games have stood out for you other than that? Because, I mean, you, you had cakewalks in a, in a couple of them. Yeah, look, Limerick, we got a very good start against Limerick, and I think put them on the back foot. I think Henry got two goals in the first maybe 20 minutes, and they were always playing catch-up from day one, and I think we kind of, in the back of our heads, we nearly knew that if they came at us, we could get up another gear and, and pull away. So that's how that kind of final uh, turned out. I think 2008, if you're regarding finals and only finals and matches, I think 2008 was a massive year for us because it was still a three in a row. It was a massive deal. We were playing Watford and I think, you know, a three in a row, there was pressure with it. And the fact that we turned up and just played so well, was, you know, that was maybe one of the most complete performances as a team in our Ireland finals, that it, it, it was very, very enjoyable and just get over And we all played well that day. There was no one taken off, you know, so we're all, we're all in cloud nine, you know. And then, of course, then you have the Super A rivalry starting in 2009, you know, massive games. I remember marking your own brother there and Paddy there, corner, corner, corner back there that day. And we had a, we had a serious tussle. I was taken off that day. He got the better of me. And, you know, taking off in our Ireland final, it's not a nice feeling. You know, it's not a, it's not a nice feeling. Um, and all he wanted to do was play the game again. But we won that game. Uh, Richie Power got a penalty. And uh, we won that game. And look, 2010 then, obviously, he destroyed us. Larry Carver getting the three goals. So I think every final kind of brings a different a different aspect to it, you know. But if, if you're talking about games in general, one of the night, biggest games that we've ever played was actually in Nolan Park. And probably the last time we talked about it against Tipperary in the qualifiers in 2013. So it was just a phenomenal atmosphere in our own backyard. <clears throat> and there's another story, a personal story for me behind that was I was named to play that night on the Thursday night, but only on the paper. I wasn't actually playing. So my name was down to play, but I wasn't actually playing. And so we kept, the team was only for the team. I told the family I wasn't playing. So I was on a bit of a downer. Now being named and then not playing it was bit of a downer but then I woke up that Saturday morning and I could just feel an, air, an aura of something is happening today and <clears throat> we went into Nolan Park and we had the food in the, the new park and just driving downtown it was packed three o'clock that day it was a balmy summer's day up to Nolan Park the match was a half seven there was no curtain raiser and there was a crowd in there since five o'clock stadium was mobbed and you know it was an era of kind of defiance you know I think I live up, I actually, <laughs> don't be saying this too loud, but I actually live outside Gurton Hill now in Inch of Europe. We had landed in Inch of Europe, Tipperary, and Fenner Hill, some people might know it. There was a big sign up, and uh, there was a coffin, and there was a nail, and a, and a hammer. And the hammer was Tipperary colours, you know, it's basically saying the final nail in the coffin, you know. And I was looking at this for a good two weeks, <laughs> going up Fenner Hill, and then I was grinding my teeth, and I was like, no way is this going to happen, you know. So we just turned on a performance, and we we're kind of struggling with injuries, and we weren't playing great, but. It was one day that we just all came together. And even me not playing, I just said, it's not about me. It's about Kenny. It's about Nolan Park. It's about tradition. And it's about 
beating Tipperary in her own backyard and it was just unbelievable that, that the atmosphere in the, in, the, in the park that day yeah it actually was crazy yeah just being there and me, obviously on the other side of the vibe hoping Tipperary would win that it just kind yeah, of felt yeah. a, as as feral an atmosphere as it, and but not in a nasty way because I don't know. I, I I don't think there's been too many nasty Tipperary games <coughs> in modern times, but it really just did feel like the place was absolutely heaving. Yeah, absolutely, and it wasn't a nasty way at all. It was just even beforehand, Henry wasn't named on the on the sheet, and he was named over the intercom being on the panel, and all the crowds. Who Mike, Michael uh, Finley the same, wasn't it? He was injured. Michael, Michael Finley was the same because all these doubts about lads injuries, but. You know that they they all came on for the panel. They all made the panel for the day, and Henry came on, and there's a big cheer. And this is from a Kilkenny's perspective now. I know you're from a Tipperary's perspective, but it was just friendly, friendly banter. And even downtown, talking to the the, the family after, they said, "Look, we had great crack with all the Tipperary guys. They came in. We had the we had the laugh. We drank a few pints. We went up. Yes, of course, they were knocked out of championship. They were sick, as we would have been as well. But it was just friendly." And there's just a real GA, a sense of GA, a sense of kind of there's something big happening. Two big counties, Tipperary and Kenny, going at it in a qualifier. It wasn't even just an Ireland, it was just a qualifier, but it was just the name of the context of it. It was just huge because Tipper were on a roll. We're after playing it a few times over, like 9, 10, 11. So there was tradition there, there was rivalry there. And it was just it was just surreal to have that moment. You know? it, was just, it was just brilliant. And even after it, just a sense of relief of winning the game and everyone we walked down to town couldn't get downtown with the bus so I think half, half our minds were delighted to walk down you know get the old pats in the back and get the cheers from the pubs in one sense we were delighted but we couldn't have let it down so it's just uh, yeah so it's just brilliant and the support from, from both sides a lot of Tipperary came that night as well and supported their own as well so it's just fantastic yeah because my memory of the game again just to give the Tipperary side of it is Larry Corbett is on fire, he had 1-1 scored, he pulls up with a hamstring, big blow to Tipperary, Owen Kelly has the goal chance, hits it while well, JJ puts out his arm, connects with his arm, 65 goes wide, and like I feel like Tipperary kind of left that one behind even though it was in the Lions then, but you probably look at it differently. Yeah, um, I suppose I do look at it differently, yeah, I look at it, I suppose, in the sense that we weren't going to be beaten that day, and it's easy to say that, it is so easy to say that now. But I just felt going down the bus that this is our patch and there was no way, no matter what was going to happen, whether, you know, Henry or JJ went off and things like that. And yeah, the game, the game was so on a balance. It was so up and down all the way through it. And Larry went off. He was on fire. He was creating his problems in the first half. If he stayed on, who knows? It could have been a different story. Own Kelly shot. Like, how lucky is that that JJ just got his hand out? You know, is it luck? Is it determination? Is it like a sense of defiance that I'm going to just throw my body at it? In that kind of scenario, would he have done the same maybe in a lesser match? Probably not. He wouldn't know the ball could have went in, tip could have won. It was just the sense that we just weren't going to be beaten. And in the dressing room going down, I remember on the bus, there was silence on the bus going down and the crowds were all outside and cheers and stuff, but there was silence. And then there was a few people just kind of saying, not today, lad, not today, no way. And then nothing, no, nothing else said, no one. We were just wound up to the last, you know, wound up to the last. And yeah, it was just, it was, it was crazy. And I think maybe the summer's afternoon and just had everything in my perspective. Bar, bar obviously, and your perspective, yeah, to Brary last. In my perspective, we won and we were delighted to be, we survived another year kind of thing. And it wasn't to Brary that put us down in that sense, you know, the nail in the coffin kind of thing. So it's just, so it just brilliant. And I think the fact that so many lads were injured coming up to it, but so many lads made a huge effort to get back. You know, we were down to Limerick, we were physios every day. Paul Murphy probably shouldn't have even talked down cornerback. He, um, he had a fractured kind of a, I think it was an Achilles tendon or an Achilles. He's an injured ankle anyway. I was coming back from an ankle injury. Henry probably wasn't right, but injuries wasn't going to stand in the way. We wanted to be out in that field. So. Which of the, like, I would say 9, 10, and 14 might probably be the high point of the, the rivalry. Now, maybe you see it differently, but is there any game in particular that you think stands out as the very very high point of this rivalry yeah um, I think 9, 10 and 11 they, they all have different games I think obviously that was the rivalry it, that rivalry probably started out in 2009 in the league final <clears throat> sorry I did actually yeah, mean in terms nine. of the All-Ireland finals but yeah you're, you're, I wasn't including the qualifier I did yeah, just yeah. mean the finals but yeah that league final in 2009 was exceptional that was like the birth I, I'd always almost see that as the birth of modern hurling because Tipperary had sort of physically put it up to Kilkenny the first team to do it since he had gone on your big run so it kind of felt like a new dawn in hurling yeah that's where that's where in my eyes where it kind of all started and they're dead right 
Um, Tipperary matches physically, they matched us mentally, and it was a draw. The game was a draw, and I went to extra time. And I think Richie Hogan got a free in the end to win it by a point, I think, in the end. And we just got over the line. But it was a sense of Tipperary are coming, and they're not going to back down. And we kind of saw that the way they played. You know, they, they matched us physically. Martin Comfort came on. I think it was um, oh, the, 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 um, the man from Killalaw, the wing back from Killalaw. I think he met him. Declan Fanning. Declan Fanning. I think he showed Declan Fanning straight away. Zoom red card straight away. Sent off. And they just weren't backing down. And usually when we got ahead of teams or got a goal, the team would sink. And, you know, we'd finish it out. But they just kept coming at us and kept coming at us. So if you're talking about Tim Ray rivalry, I think that was the game that actually started it. The league final 2009. And I think... <clears throat> I think that Ireland 2009 was a huge game for Kilkenny. I think Tipperary had us rattled that day. And if you're looking back at it, and look, I'm a Kilkenny man, they bullied a lot of us that day. I know I got bullied that day. I was taken off. Um, you know, when you talk about bullying, I don't mean like bullying. I mean just being, being out fought. You know, there was an intensity Tipperary bought that day. And I think just the, the one thing that let them down was maybe that mental edge in 2009 that when we got the goal they just sank that little bit and we kicked on and won the game and you could see that and then in 2010 where Ron Kelly was, was doing that to his helmet that obviously meant that they looked back in that Ireland and said right lads if you can get a goal or when they get a goal keep your heads if you're up by 10 points keep your heads because I remember there was only 2 or 3 minutes to go you were 6 or 7 points up and Larry Carver was flying it but Ron Kelly was still doing that you know just to keep the minds so Every year Ireland was different. I think 2009 was huge, as in, if Tipperary won it, they possibly could have won 10 and 11 and 12 as well. You just don't know. Like every year, you can't say. But they played very well that day. And we were kind of lucky to come out on top that day. But we did, thankfully. But it's down probably to the more mental side of it and that we had more experience. I think 2014, if you go outside of that, 2014, that first game, that drawn game, I don't think, you probably have the stats sharing, but I don't think there was too many wides. I think stats-wise, hooks, blocks, in terms of accuracy, shots taken, it was probably nearly 100% from both teams. It was just a serious, serious game. And I came on in that game, and I remember just the intensity straight away, the pace of it, just how clean-cut both teams were. Now, we, we felt afterwards that our defence... And, well, all our team, and in particular maybe our defence, didn't work hard enough that we gave Tipperary too much space. And I suppose in the replay, it was just hooking a block and back to intensity. And this word intensity is bandied around Kilkenny for I don't know how many years. But being realistic, that's what it was. It was just we worked harder in the replay. But that match was a serious game in 2014 as well. I don't think you come across a more kind of a sass rated or a, or, a better, or a better game than that in the last couple of years. The, the one game that was just, <clears throat> I mean, from any point of view, it was great, but the 18-point win in 2012, Tipperary completely fell apart. You got the goal that probably turned it from a win for Kilkenny into, I think that was kind of when the, the floodgates opened at that particular point. What was it like to, to hammer your local rivals by such a, and I mean, obviously it was the Tommy Lair. Jackie, Pa, Burke, Circus going on in one corner. But what was that game like? <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, I, suppose, I suppose... I actually got man in the match that day, but no one even talked about that because they're all talking about Bloody Larry and Tommy Welch going at him. So <laughs> all my fame from that game was gone. So uh, yeah, I, I had a good game that day, but it was kind of... I suppose it was a surprise for us, but we felt because we'd been playing Tipperary in 9, 10, 11, you know, and they've been pushing us close, we won, they won. So it was a surprise maybe that they crumbled so much in the second half. And it was the goal. And I remember Cummins probably should have blocked it, to be fair. Uh, I was a good bit out. It went into the top corner, but it was a, definitely a savable shot. And I'd say he's probably kicking himself over. But we just, yeah, I think, like, if you look at that game, you were only two points down, really two points up going in the first, in the first half. Um, and it was just probably that goal that changed it. And we upped the gear. And the whole Tommy scenario and Larry Carver scenario, look, at least they tried something different. I'm not going to play him anyway. I think Larry got a bit of stick in Tipperary over it. You know, he's nearly been the he'd been outgoated as the as a scapegoat for that game. But I suppose on a personal level, yeah, to get man in the match against my biggest rival, against McKinney's biggest rival on a on a huge day, it was it was absolutely brilliant. And I hadn't played well against Tipperary for a while, I thought. I think in um 
2010, obviously, it was taken off. 2011, I was struggling to make the team. So to come back onto it, and I was coming back from a leg injury. I broke my leg. Uh, I spoke the fibia and tibia in 2012. 2011, actually. And basically, people were saying that my career was kind of over and he probably retire now. So for me to come back from that injury, to get back onto that great and Kenny team, you know, very hard, to be honest, but to get back onto it was huge for me. And I think one of the things was that maybe got me beat us in the qualifiers and Cody changed it up. And only for that, I probably wouldn't have been on it. But to come back from that and then to play Tipperary and get me in the match, it was massive for me. And coming back down to Ernie for then, there was a lot of, a lot of free pints from me there over, over the border there as well. So in the local, so I'm delighted, yeah, really was. Yeah, and then like the last season or two, I mean, in and out of the team, and you, you called time, I think, at the end of 2014. Did you enjoy the last year or two? Did you, did you sense that uh, I'm going to announce my retirement or did you kind of decide after that season? Yeah, uh, I tell you, it's actually 2012 is the first time it came into my mind to retire because <coughs> sorry, I was getting water. Um, <coughs> yeah, 2012 was the first time I, t- I even thought about retiring because we played Galway in the Ireland final and we drew. And I <coughs> was dropped for the replay. And the way it kind of worked was, now, looking back, yeah, I was dropped, big deal, but... Back then, I was so consumed by hurling that I was in an awful place over it. You know, to be dropped for an Ireland final, it's not easy. It's kind of like maybe you're getting the blame game. And I, for sure, was not the worst hurler on that day, <clears throat> the drawing game. I, I held me on, but I found over the years that I was nearly always one being taken off for maybe, you know, corner forward syndrome. I think a lot of corner forwards that around the country can relate to it. If something was going wrong, you haul off the corner forward. But I didn't play the... I came on in the replay. And I did well, but I was just so kind of out and hurt over that incident that I said, look, this is nearly enough for me. And I nearly retired in 2012. And in fairness, we spoke about earlier on, and uh, Brother Damien Brennan sat down and he said, if you go now, you're going to have an awful bitterness to Kilkenny, and you're going to have an awful bitterness to Hurling. And he was dead right. He was absolutely dead right. And I said, yeah, you're dead right. The game, Kilkenny is not about me, you know, and if I go now, I'll hold this grudge forever. So... I said it the past, the past. I went into 2013 and we went to the qualifiers and Corkby is in, in the stadium actually that day. We didn't get to run out of that. But I actually had one of my best years club-wise uh, in 2013 as well. And I was playing really well as well in Kenny training. And I was surprised not to be on the team, but I wasn't. But that didn't bother me because I knew now I was at a stage where anything could happen. That I most likely wasn't going to be on the team, but I was going to make an effort in such a way that I wasn't going to sulk because, you know, your body language around the setup can be seen. I had my innings with Kenny. Brian Cody picked me when he probably shouldn't have picked me and gave me great experience. I won a lot of things. So I wasn't going to, you know, turn my back on it and go, ah, it's all about me. So I absolutely did my best for everyone coming in. And I think <clears throat> 2013, the fact that we didn't make it to our Ireland and, you know, I just felt that there was more, one more in the team. I said, I'll go back in 2014. And going back in January, I said, this is going to be my last year. I said, whatever happens, it wasn't about playing, it wasn't about starting, it wasn't about winning their learnings, it was about going back to 2014 and giving it me all. Because I felt, a few lads felt the same, that the way 2013 ended, we felt that maybe we should just at least try and get to another our learning and maybe try and win it. And that's what happened. 2014, yeah, we, we got to learn against Tip, drew the first game and won the second day. And there was no intention. I was After we won it, I was happy. I took in Brock Park, I sat out there for a good hour after the game. I was taking in all the crowd, even before I was taking it in. I was more at ease with myself. I said, look, if I come on, I come on. If I don't, I don't. Now, don't get me wrong. The same drive was there, but I was just more at ease with myself of what was going to happen. And <clears throat> yeah, we won. We went out on top. I went out on top as a player, I suppose. Got me a lot of medal and left. And it was always going to happen in 2014, no matter what. So um, I was happy enough just that we won in Ireland. didn't make a difference. Because obviously the medals are brilliant, but... I presume the, the memories of the journey, like we talked about earlier on, and even like one of your teammates was saying to me, you know, majority of the lads, they have the same seat on the bus the whole time. And I presume you were one of those uh, kind of creatures that have it too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, look, it is definitely the memories. Look, we've all the medals. My father has my medals. I never even take them out. He had them at home. I don't know what I do with them. But it's the memories. It's, uh, yeah, I remember like when I'm more of a kind of mature person on the bus or more mature person on the, on the, on the team that, 
I used to get collected and running for going to tournaments to matches and stuff. And say the newer guys would be on the bus and they might sit into your chair, you know, and you come on the bus and the, the, all you hear is like, oh, oh, trouble. <laughs> and uh, I, I'd never tell him to get up, but I think the lad who would be sitting there would probably know that that was where I'd be sitting. You know, I used to sit beside Derek Lee, PJ Ryan and McCabe would be in the, in the two seats behind us and we'd be having banter all the way up to Cork Park or whatever, but... People had their chairs and people had their special kind of things. I did a match day. I used to wear two socks. You know, I used to get slagged about that. It's actually cork socks I used to wear underneath the Kilkenny socks. Um, just the thing I had. Yeah. Just. How did that start, though? What? How did that start? It was probably from CIT. I went to college in CIT in, in Cork. And we got to the Fitzgibbon Cup final. And I played very well with CIT that year. And I think it's actually Waterford IT that beat us. And I just kept on to the socks. And I used to just, I used, I used to wear them for training. I used to just wear them for matches. So I had a pair of cork socks underneath me to carry socks. And for some reason, I'm a, crib, I'm a, habit, a creature of habit. I, if something kind of works for me, or if I think it brings me a bit of luck, I will do it. So yeah, I always had cork socks on them. And they were fairly well worn come 2014, now I'll tell you that. Uh, but I had, to, I had to discard them there around 2008. It's just gone too bad. But um, yeah, so there's the, the spirit and the banter. And... The dressing room crack, that's what really made it. You know, the physio room, going in, taking the piss out of the boys on the physio bed, you know, uh, oh, big family is up on it again, or, you know, Jackie, what's wrong with you today? And no one wants to be on the physio bed when Cody walked in, because then Cody know that maybe you're carrying a knock, or if there's a big game coming up, you'd be surprised the amount of lads wouldn't be in the physio room, you know? <laughs> There'd be just that inkling of, is he right or is he not right? So... The slagging in the physio room, the slagging in the dressing room, just the good banter of, you know, just, just good crack, just walking in a careless kind of summer's evening, you know, slagging Tommy about maybe a club game the week before, maybe losing to Bally Callan or something, you know, driving wrong, you know, that kind of way, John Heine be there slagging him and, you know, just winding the lads up and, you know, it's just, just brilliant crack and uh, everything from matches and even after matches, like league games, I suppose it changed. In the early days, we used to always go out for league games. <clears throat> and about 2004, 2005, that changed. We actually drank more in championship games than we did in the league. The league is about getting fit, getting your body right, and being in the best shape you could be for championship. But after every championship game, we were out. You know, we were out that night. We enjoyed it. We enjoyed our wins. We enjoyed our losses. And, uh, yeah, it was just it was just brilliant cracking. All the medals in the world, it's about, it's about the friends. It's about the crack you had. The holidays, like, I've seen the world. I've travelled to America, New Zealand, Australia... Phenomenal holidays with a phenomenal team, backroom team, with uh, managers, you know, and we got it all for free. Yeah, we put in the effort, but there was fundraisers, we were supporters club, a lot of money got into it. We got spending the money, like we didn't want for anything gear-wise. We didn't get a whole heap of it, but we didn't want for anything. Sometimes we get the summer boots in winter, sometimes we get the winter boots in summer, but we'd make a, you know, we'd have a laugh about it. If you want a pair of boots, you get a bloody pair of boots, you know, that kind of way, so... It was just, it was brilliant times, yeah, brilliant times. I suppose just before finishing up, the fact that Brian Cody was able to either have players retire or drop so many huge star names over the years and still keep winning All-Irelands, and I suppose the 2015 <coughs> one more so than any other, because people would look at that as probably his greatest achievement because it didn't, you know, it didn't have the same level of star names. Is that kind of a testimony to how good he actually is? Yeah, um... I think the thing with Brian in my time playing with Brian and maybe with that team was his biggest thing was to keep was to keep us all grounded and to keep us all kind of humble. And I think humbleness in sport is huge. I think if guys get ahead of themselves in a sense of they think they're too big for the team or it's about themselves or, you know, they're getting a bit cocky maybe down the town or whatever the case may be or they're out and about. I think it kind of feeds into the team and it feeds into maybe the belief in that player and their levels drop just slightly. So I think the big thing for Brian is to keep guys grounded, to keep them humble. And you often hear about speeches, you know, sports people talking about speeches and humbleness always comes into it. And that's for sure one thing Brian did. And no matter what you had coming back in January, whether you're 100 a year, where you're an all-star, where you won man of the matches, it was a clean slate. And we believed it was a clean slate because... He dropped the likes of Charlie Carters. He dropped the likes of DJ Carey, <coughs> Henry Sheff, and He said, we all did our time. And the proof was in the pudding that if your time was up, and if he felt you weren't going to be part of this team, he was going to drop you. And that kept us on our toes as well. I remember coming out from a meeting, 2007, 2008, and Tommy Wright said to me, saying, 
God, you really have to be playing well to be on the team. And I'm looking at it going, this is the best hurler I've ever seen. Like, And he's thinking like this. So if he's thinking like this, everyone was thinking like this. So he kept that kind of air of, I suppose, uncertainty about your place on the team. Even though you probably knew what the team was going to be, you still felt that maybe you mightn't play. And that kept your edge up. That kept your kind of performance levels up and kept the, per- the individual trying to maybe better themselves every year. So I think that was one of the biggest things to Brian in my time. And then, of course, his hunger, his drive, it feeds into the team. And I suppose his ruthlessness. And I think in 2015, it was one of his best achievements, no doubt. But every year, it's hard to back up our arguments. Every year is an achievement. But I think, well, I can only imagine what was being said in 2015 was all the talk was about the boys being retired, like the Sixers went in 2014. So Henry went, JJ went, Harrow, myself, Tommy. So all the talk in 2015 was he's building a new team and he can't win it without the boys. Sure, like, if I was a player back then, I'd be going through the wall to prove that wrong, you know? So it's as nearly easy to turn up training and saying, the boys are gone, it's about us now, this is our time. That's the way I would be thinking. And probably what's been said in the dressing room that the lads are gone and it's nearly undermining what you're doing now. And, you know, probably fed into winning the All-Ireland in 2015. And a final question then before we finish. Do you think Brian Cody can win another All-Ireland before he finishes up with Kilkenny? Gosh, Shane, you <laughs> the last question, the right one. Um, well, it depends how long he's going to stay. Uh, <laughs> well, like TJ T- Reid is, is still... Arguably, probably the best player in the country. If Richie Hogan can get himself 100% right, he's still one of the best players in the country. But like in a couple of years' time, probably the very, very best players on the team will probably no longer be to the forefront in terms of best in the country. So is there enough coming through? Is there enough of a window for players to come through and the best lads to still be at the top to make it happen? Yeah, it's hard to know. And even this year now, sure, look, it could be a write-off. You just don't know what's going to happen with the GA and things like that. And <clears throat> it's going to be matches, but... Um, yeah, TJ Reid is 31, 32, which is the same. Um, there is, there's always players coming through with Kenny. And the thing about Kenny is you mightn't even have to be standing out, but you can make it at the senior ranks. Derek Ling done it. Martin Comfort didn't play a whole lot of underage. And he got his all-stars and played senior. There's always players coming through in Kenny. Um, but the question was, will Brian Cody win in Ireland? Is, depends how long he stays. I can't see him win another one in the next three years. But that's only that's only my opinion. So um, you might let that <laughs> that might have to go viral. <laughs> I'm not sure. But this year's written off. So what I'm saying that after this year, players will be fresh. Like you can't beat freshness. Um, and a lot of our guys at fence were kind of were injured. You know, uh, Adrian Mullen after doing his cruciate this year. Uh, Jerry Edward was carrying knocks for a long time. Richie Hogan had knocks for a long time. TJ Reid the rest will do him good. So I think you'll have a lot of lads coming back that were carrying niggles and knocks. James Marr never recovered from his knee injury as such. So this little break could do him wonders. So on that point of view, they could come back hungrier than ever and could win next year. So <laughs> just let us all know. Taggy, brilliant stuff. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining me. Shane, pleasure. Thanks very much.